Hi, I'm Sheila James Kuehl and this is Get Used To It. Uh, as you know, if you've ever seen the show before, this is a discussion show on issues of interest to the lesbian, gay, bisexual community. Uh, and today we're uh, very lucky to have three wonderful guests and our discussion topic today is going to be uh, really gay and lesbian education programs. Uh, often we are caught in the larger world sort of making our way, coming out if we can, uh, but the education that we receive rarely has anything to do with our real lives, our history, our culture, uh, anything having to do with what we know to be true. Conversely, uh, straight people rarely have an opportunity to experience our community. Um, some of them just wouldn't do it even if they had the opportunity. So today we're going to talk about some of those education programs that are uh, available, that are springing up all around the country. And I'm very pleased to introduce my three guests. First, Simon LeVay, who is the co-founder of the Institute of Gay and Lesbian Education, and as many of our viewers know, also did the work uh, on the uh, uh, e experiments concerning the hypothalamus and the difference in the brains of gay and straight men, which I think that was published in 91. 91. So welcome, Simon. Very yes. happy to have you here. Happy. Um, my next guest, Virginia Uribe, is uh, a teacher <coughs> at uh, Fairfax High School, but much more than that, the founder and coordinator for the Project 10 program for the Los Angeles Unified School District. Uh, which is a program to uh, support and, and uh, deal with the educa uh, education of gay and lesbian bisexual youths in our schools here in LA Unified and I think other schools too as well, That's right? right? Yes. Great, welcome. Thank Happy you. to have you here. Thank you, Sheila. And our third guest is Paulino Tamayo, who's a, a student at UC, actually was a student I think at mm -hmm. UCLA, is the uh, director of a campus retention program targeting underrepresented uh, student populations at UCLA and last year was a recipient of uh, the UCLA Lambda Alumni Scholarship uh, uh, given to one undergraduate every year but for uh, being actively involved in the gay and lesbian community and uh, organizations on campus. Welcome, very happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, Simon, let's start with you. Um, you. You heard sort of the way I introduced the show and I know that uh, the Institute of Gay and Lesbian Education is sort of unique. Would you tell us a little about it? It's basically a night school that operates here in West Hollywood uh, in a city-owned building uh, next to West Hollywood Park. And uh, what we're trying to do, it's been running now since for three years, since 1992. We're trying to uh, put together educational programs that really fill that missing gap that you mentioned in your introduction, you know, this, this part of our education that has to do with our own identity as lesbians and gay men. And um, I think lots of gays and lesbians are very well educated uh, and you know I've had so many years of schooling I can't even think about it but uh, in all that time I hardly learned one single fact I think you know related to my identity as a gay man I think we did once read Plato's symposiums so that was like one one bright <laughs> bright moment in my education but aside from that nothing you know and I think that that silence that gap is incredibly damaging or limiting you know to gay people in their ability to present themselves in society and work for the gay community and uh, feel good about themselves and generally you know function uh, well as gay people so what kind of uh, courses are are offered at the at the institute uh, and who the, teaches them? Well, the people who teach them, uh, they're a mixed bag of people. Some of them are academics at colleges in the area. Some of them are professionals, lawyers, or doctors. Um, and uh, we have creative people, writers, um, and uh, screenwriters, um, people in um, television. So uh, it's quite a mixed bunch of people uh, who teach. And the courses are on topics like uh, gay and lesbian psychology, history, politics. We had a law symposium once, um, and uh, I've taught biology classes. So it's it's a lot of range of different disciplines, but they all have this focus that they're or most of them that they're focused on this theme of what is you know, special about gay people, what do gay people need to know um, about themselves and their place in the world that they might not otherwise have learned. I heard you say f that part of the reason why you thought this was important was. Uh, in terms of people's involvement in the community, uh, what's the connection between, really, I guess, about learning about ourselves, which seems very personal, and, yeah. and community work? 
Because I think, you know, to, to, to be a good sort of ambassador for the gay community, if you like, you need like motivation and knowledge and skills. And the motivation, well, I think now that a lot of gays and lesbians really do have the motivation, you know, to get involved, do something for the community, partly as a result of the AIDS epidemic, but also because of the general history of development of the community. But in terms of knowledge and skills, that's more, you know, what you, you really need to go to school for, if you like. You, know, you really need to know something about the history of our movement, a place in the world in different societies, psychological development of gay people, political issues, legal issues. This is all stuff you really have to sit down and consciously learn. And that's the kind of thing that uh, we're trying to provide. This is an interesting shift for you, though. I mean, as a oh, scientist, yeah. I mean, you hit every newspaper, yeah. every magazine in the world, really, I think, with your work on the hypothalamus. Yeah. And now, but you, you've really shifted your focus to, to education. How, how yeah, well, I have been an educator all my life, as well as being a scientist. You know, I, I did a lot of teaching when I was at Harvard and also in, at uh, UCSD. So I have been an educator as well as a bench scientist. But yes, it is a shift. And um, it really comes out of my own psychological development, probably, you know, a sense that I really want to do something for the community and uh, something more directly f for the community than simply sitting in a, uh, at a microscope and uh, looking at brain cells or something like that. Well, Virginia, you had somewhat the same experience, although you are a teacher and you are uh, essentially working in the school, you know, system. But uh, tell us a little about Project 10 and, the, and sort of the related programs and what they're for. I think it was rage. I think that I was so angry that we had a portion of our school population, our gay, lesbian, bisexual students, who were either totally ignored by the system or treated as objects of hate and bigotry within the schools. And uh, the public school system is supposed to exist for everyone. And here was a group that was not only ignored, but terribly stigmatized. And the kids just suffered enormously. So that was probably my motivating factor that got me started. I wanted the schools to provide some kind of a safe place for their gay and lesbian population, some place where the young people could go, people that they could talk to. Uh, uh, I wanted really to make them feel safe on the school campuses. And uh, that was uh, how I got started, Project. I got started at Fairfax High School. We began to train the faculty there at Fairfax provide a little support group there. And as people heard about it, it uh, kind of caught on because everyone was saying, well, yes, we do have gay, lesbian, bisexual students. Nobody wants to acknowledge it. We do have them. They do suffer terribly, and they're at very high risk for dropping out of school. So that's what uh, has been happening in the last 10 years. Of course, the program you know, evolved. And it was not possible to simply provide support groups for the students without providing a broad educational program because it was like a cry in the wilderness. I mean, people are just so uninformed about gay, lesbian issues. So we had to develop a, an educational program to go along with this support program. So is there an actual curriculum that the students can participate in? No, there's not a curriculum, and Project 10 is not a class. Uh, it's not a course of study or anything like that. I think it's more of a concept. It's a concept that these are, this is part of our school population, that these students deserve equity in the school system, and that uh, our school system must buy into that concept. And we try to do that by doing, having workshops, uh, having speakers come, speak to classes, speak to groups of teachers, groups of counselors. And at the same time, we try to provide these support groups on the campuses. We try to take out of the closet the subject of gay and lesbian youth and get it in as much of a visible form as possible. And there's a prom, too, isn't there? Yes. Well, everybody's <laughs> read about that by now. That's all part of the evolutionary process. Uh, the first thing that we uh, did that was uh, <clears throat> really unusual, branching out from these support groups, was that we held a conference at Occidental College uh, two years ago. Now we've already had two of them that was called Models of Pride, where we invited gay, lesbian, bisexual, although it wasn't limited to them, but students from all over the school district to attend an all-day conference, and uh, at which we had was, you know, we had panels and groups and speakers and entertainment and so on. It was wonderful. We had three or four hundred young people that attended each one of these conferences. So that was our first branch into something off the campuses. 
Then we got uh, <laughs> some people, I was even a little afraid of this, but some people said, you know, we really ought to have a prom. <laughs> that's what the kids want, and uh, that's what uh, they feel is something that they have missed, an experience that they have missed on the high school level. So we uh, put our resources together, and we did hold a, a prom at uh, a hotel in Los Angeles. Now we've held two of them, uh -huh. and they were great events. And each time something like that happens, I think it, uh, well, it fills the, not only the young people, but everyone who knows about it, it fills them with such a sense of, uh, of their own identity and of their place, their role in the whole school system. So those are the kinds of things that we're involved in. Well, uh, Paulino, you're, I guess, among the four of us, the closest at this moment to sort of being fresh out of the educational experience, your uh, junior high and high school experience, your undergraduate experience at UCLA, and, and your graduate student experience. Um, and I, I wanted to know a little bit, I guess, from you about two things. One is what that was like, what your experience was like in, in relationship to whether it might have helped at all if you'd had, you know, such programs <clears throat> really to be involved in. And then I, I hope to tell us a little bit about the new program at UCLA that I, I think is evolving. Um, I, actually, um, talking about the prom, I'm reminded, um, uh, this past year I've been a volunteer with um, Eagle Center, which is a continuing high school for lesbian gay um, um, students. And a lot of the students participated in the prom, and um, I was I was glad because we we took the students at Eagles to um, a studio in Paramount to screen a videotaping of the prom, and I think um, at least at least on the on the university level um, in, in, in higher education in that kind of of um, atmosphere. Students are provided with several opportunities, at least in my case, to relive high school experiences that I was not able to live. I remember going to my prom and uh, not, not being able to take um, someone that I wanted to take or, or, or being set up on a blind date with, uh, with, a girl, with the girlfriend's girlfriend. Um, uh, but watching the, the, the tape of the prom um, was really exciting and, and some of the students didn't really know, couldn't really understand my excitement over it because I wasn't really there. But just being able to watch other students, I think, high school students, being able to have a prom that they wanted to have and to be in a prom where they're with the, the, the person that they want to be, uh, regardless of, of their gender. Um, and, and as well, I was involved um, um, with SHOUT, uh, students honestly opening up together. It's a program on UCLA that helps. That it, it came out of Project 10 huh. uh, that helps facilitate college students going out to high school students to, to kind of act as mentors or, um, um, among peers to kind of um, be role models for high school students to pursue um, higher education um, <clears throat> and and go on into into colleges and universities. Uh, so I think in those ways. Um, I'm, I'm trying to relive my high school experiences because but it, sounds it wasn't like, the same thing. It sounds like a lot of our activities, and I think this has probably been the case through generations, if, where we could even be out at all, are really concentrated outside of the classroom, outside of the sort of subject matter areas that, that educators consider the real education. I mean, what you do with your social life, that's not... The, you know the academic the real center of it right. but in essence we're seeing something different really happening now aren't we in terms of the the subject matter of our lives um, entering as something more positive not mm -hmm. just the pathologies that we used to always be taught uh, in when it was mentioned at all in psychology do you find that happening at UCLA um, and other definitely other places? most definitely um, in particular I think a lot of the students that I was um, active with and, and involved in these, you know, community type um, services, um, we began to to look within the campus and kind of s examine exactly what's happening in in our classes, what's happening with uh, professors, with instructors, with other students, in terms of coming um, uh, coming to recognize that there's a lot of history and a lot of contemporary issues that pertain to. Um, lesbian gay bisexual population that's not addressed in the classroom. Um, I remember on several occasions my um, very minimal, mi minimal, minimal attempts at um, questioning professors and instructors about how this particular subject relates to um, the lesbian gay bisexual experience, how, it, how um, 
um, why is it that we're not discussing lesbian gay authors? Um, why is it that um, uh, we're refusing to examine lesbian gay issues um, in, in various works of art? That's, that to me is very obvious and, and even at a point where I can point them out, it's still not explored. Um, to a point now where um, from one of the courses um, that was set up um, with the Council on Educational Development it's a program on campus that helps facilitate bringing in classes that are unique um, in various ways. It was an introduction to lesbian gay, um, um, introduction to lesbian gay studies. Um, I remember it running for two years. I took it the second year that it was on. And out of that class, actually out of the, out of the class prior to that, but starting with that class, um, um, a committee on lesbian gay studies, lesbian gay bisexual studies was set up by students uh, to explore the possibility of setting up a curriculum that's inclusive of lesbian gay uh, and bisexual um, history, bisexual, uh, lesbian gay bisexual peoples and their experiences. Um, it started very small um, and what came out of it was a journal uh, which was a collection of, of papers and, and um, thesis uh, of um, of students from the introduction to uh, lesbian gay studies course um, and then it's evolved um, to a point where now the the chancellor has uh, initiated a task force on the lesbian gay bisexual studies at UCLA uh, basically the task force is set out to create um, um, a curriculum um, basically to set up a lesbian gay study, lesbian gay bisexual studies minor, um, kind of similar to specializations on campus, uh, for students who want to pursue this kind of specialization, to pursue um, studies on, on the experiences and the history of lesbian gay bisexual people. Um, and it's very exciting on campus. It's a very exciting thing on campus. Um, for the past year, it's been about the only thing that has been a major focus for a lot of the campus organizations to get involved, to, to start working out, weeding out among the various courses taught at UCLA, those classes that, um, that do discuss lesbian, gay, bisexual issues, and the classes that should have been inclusive of lesbian, gay, bisexual studies, um, and courses that need to be created that pertain to the experiences of, of a population at UCLA that's been ignored. Um, there are several students on campus that I'm aware of who have made attempts at, at bringing discourse in the classroom. Um, um, to be inclusive of, of lesbian, gay, bisexual experiences. And, and a lot of them have um, completed their stories, you know, having failed. Uh, professors well, and it's kind of scary, courses. too. I it's mean, in, in a sense, every time you, you, I remember in a discussion that we had when you said every time you turn in a paper that has anything mm -hmm. to do with a gay issue, mm -hmm. you wonder, am I going to, you know, what, what will be my, the evaluation of this paper? Right. Will it be evaluated on its merits or is the content is it kind of scary even to include that content? Mm -hmm. I'm, and, and I'm not alone in that. A lot of students, I know I've, I've worked on group papers with students, with other students, um, gay and straight, and asked them what would they think if we were to turn in a paper that was uh, relevant to um, lesbian, gay, bisexual studies. And, and students, students are open to that kind of study, that kind of, um, of exploration of, of, of in, in academia. Um, but that moment when we turn that paper in, all of a sudden it's kind of the question of, okay, well, you know, let's have see I, what Have happens. I blown the whole grade, uh, right? Yeah, you know, um, how is this going to be graded, evaluated? Well, um, there's sort of a relationship here. I want to ask uh, sort of an, an evaluation, I guess, uh, uh, among the three of you. There's, a, there's an ongoing discussion about, in essence, this sort of notion of separatism. Uh, it, separatism in academia, a criticism of uh, black studies, Chicano studies, Asian Pacific studies, women's studies, and naturally we will, you know, sort of trailing along all the major mm -hmm. movements in this country as we are, strong as we are, coming into that same notion. Um, in essence, you started a whole new school in order to, to study these issues, Simon. When I told my stepmother that I was getting involved in running this school, she said, how can you do this? You know, why cut yourself off from society and form this little clique, this little island, you know, that everyone should be dealing with everyone else and everyone should love each other and so on. And of course, I believe that. But there is this problem that gay people really have to go through this developmental process where they step outside of their family of origin or whatever and really sort of very consciously join the group of gay and lesbian people and I think that's why you need to have something that's aimed 
at gay people and specifically help them to learn what they need to learn. And I don't think it, it, these things, even though they're kind of address particularly gay people, probably this minor that Paulina's talking about, it'll be almost all, well, mostly gay, gays and lesbians who take the class, but nevertheless, it sort of radiates out from that, and you have a sort of secondary effect that really inter is much broader, because the people who take the classes uh, are then better equipped to be, you know, good ambassadors for their community, and also it affects the faculty because you know, right now UCLA still has very few openly gay and lesbian faculty. I mean, it's amazing how it's probably less than six or something. Uh, and uh, out of a faculty of goodness, how many hundred? And uh, once you have something like this in place, then you know other faculty can uh, ha have permission, if you like, to bring up these topics and say, yes, this book is about a gay and lesbian theme, even if it's not in a gay and lesbian class. So there's kind of snowball effect. But we, we, we're criticized for that mm. kind of focus because it's trivialized. I, I don't know if you found the same thing with your own mm. scientific work, mm. but I remember mm. when Black Studies was first established at UCLA, I was an Associate Dean of Students and, uh, and Women's Studies. Um, it was a risk, not just for students turning in papers or taking the classes because they could always take six other classes at the same time, but supposing you were doing your doctoral thesis on something relating to women. Oh my God, it wasn't real academic work, you know, and you, and you would be advised, oh, don't do that. You should do something, you know, seriously academic, not this kind of trivial thing. I don't know if you had the same experience with your scientific work, but... Uh, well, no one at the Salk Institute was going to tell me what to do or not do. I mean, there is <laughs> academic freedom and so on, so I don't think that was a problem for me. Um, but uh, in general, that can happen. Another th sort of thing that people bring up is the question about whether when you have an academic discipline that's linked to a group of people in society, um, you could, it, it can turn into something more like advocacy or boosterism rather than really being, if you like, academic, being objective or something like that. And I, that's a serious issue that people have to think about. And, and, um, Did you find it's this sort of isolating, I mean, I don't know whether to call it a, a push-pull, but uh, it, just in your own uh, professional life, Gina, where you suddenly were so identified, and yet you're also, you teach gifted students at Fairfax. I mean, you have a, a larger context for your academic work. Do you feel, were you accused of separatism, or I guess as our governor calls it, tribalism, as though we invented uh, <laughs> making ourselves separate? That's one of my very favorite. Uh, I think one of the regents, or someone testifying at the regents said, that's like blaming chemotherapy for cancer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I've not been accused of that because, frankly, uh, gay and lesbian issues have never reached the level where they could be accused of being separate. Mm -hmm. uh, the way I see it, uh, the, all of these things really relate to each other in such fundamental ways because in education I find that uh, part of the problem is getting people comfortable with the issue. That there are a lot of people who are not uh, real redneck, anti-gay people, but they're not comfortable with the issue. So how do we, if I can use the word normalize, normalize the conversation to bring it in so that people are not so self-conscious in talking about it. Then the other problem is that most people really don't have a whole lot of information, and that's where your mm -hmm. institute comes in and the work that's being done at UCLA, because I think there are teachers who would talk about the influence of authors in English or the influence in various aspects of art or inside they simply don't know the information and even though they might be willing to do it they don't have the information so part of what uh, what we do and the level where I am is we just try to get people to bring out their feelings so that we can talk about those feelings and how do you respond to issues that are brought up spontaneously in class. You know, how do you examine your own thoughts to be sure you're okay with the issue yourself so you can just respond normally to things that go on in a classroom situation. And um, I guess as time goes on, I, the word I hear so often here is evolution. We are in the midst of a great evolution in, ed in education. I mean, from a few years ago where you just didn't bring up this subject at all, to now, you know, how to bring it up, how to sensitize people, you know, how to give them the information that they need to encourage discussions in class because the kids bring the subject up all the time. 
And so it's a question of uh, teachers either sweeping it under the rug or acting awkward <laughs> about it or, you know, how do we get them comfortable with this subject? So that's, that's what our job is, I think. Well, and also I, I think um, it, there's, there's no sort of respect for the, uh, to get a handle on the subject matter itself. I mm -hmm. think we've probably all had very similar experiences growing up, even though we grew up in very different places in which our own people were essentially invisible. Now, in our generation, we didn't even know there was such a people. At least I didn't. Um, it was so bizarre and so invisible. But I don't remember any discussion within the context of any class anywhere. Do you? Did you have a discussion reading Plato? Yes, actually, yes. I mean, the topic was discussed. I mean, not in the sort of detail I would like today, but uh, it was mentioned, and I think that, you know, that was one thing I clearly remember. Uh, but I was at, a, I mean, the school I was at, a very tradi a traditional all-boys school in, in, in boarding school in, uh, in England. It's a very different environment from Fairfax High or something like that. It's, it's, uh, uh, there was mu actually much more acceptance of homosexuality in, in that tradition than there is in LA Unified uh, School District. Have you had um, sort of much success in terms of attracting students? I mean, do people want to come to the institute? Oh and yes, study yeah, definitely. We have lots of students. Um, actually, our problems are more in terms of you know financial problems and getting enough space to teach and uh, so on than uh, than in uh, uh, than in uh, attracting students. But we definitely want to expand because we'd like eventually to be able to develop a um, MA program. Uh, degree. Right now we don't grant degrees, so uh, we'd like to expand so we can do that. And for that we do need a larger student body, uh, more space, more permanent faculty, that kind of thing. And Paulino, do you, do you, it sounds as though the uh, uh, administration at UCLA has been supportive so far, but do you get a sense of any uh, antagonism or antipathy at the university about it? <coughs> um, I wouldn't necessarily say administration because I haven't seen I don't think I've seen a lot of administration, a, a lot of the administration um, coming into the process of, of putting together this proposal and writing up this program. Um, a lot of the faculty, however, has made um, commitments to supporting the, this this movement for an LGB studies program. Um, a lot of professors have uh, made commitments to set up courses that would be inclusive of LGB studies, or or classes on LGB um, experiences. Um, so in that respect, administration, I think, has, has provided its support. Um, the fact, I think, that there's the Chancellor's Task Force um, for the past year that has been working on this on a consistent basis throughout the whole year um, suggests you know, that the, the administration has some, uh, some inclinations to, to, to see something like this happen, uh, to provide funding for it, and, you know, and whatnot class spaces. Well, let me a ask you to hold the answer to the second part of it, which was mm -hmm. about any antagonism. So we need to take a break. We'll be right back. Don't go away. Come back and watch more of Get Used to It. Pick up your telephone right now and call the number on your screen. Find out how you can enrich your family values by learning about your gay children. We had no idea what the gay community was like. Learn how these parents deal with their fears about attending parents' flag meetings. One of my biggest fears was that I would see someone that I knew. Call the telephone number on your screen right now and see how these parents have taken themselves to acceptance and beyond. Because that parent does not know the positives yet about the gay community. Do you ever think about what your pet means to you? To me, it means unconditional love. Imagine what that means to someone who's ill. Hi, I'm Greg Luganis, and I want to tell you about an organization called Paws LA. That's Pets Are Wonderful Support. They help people living with AIDS or HIV keep and care for their pets. Paws LA needs your help. If you'd like to ensure someone else's quality of life, please call 213-876-PAWS. Hi, I'm Sheila James Kewell. Welcome back to Get Used To It. Today we're talking about uh, gay and lesbian education uh, by, for, and about gay, lesbian, bisexual people in the context of junior high, high school, university, graduate, uh, institute, separate institutes, uh, etc. My guests, Simon LeVay, Gina Uribe, and Paulino Tamayo. 
Um, welcome back. We were talking about the program at UCLA uh, that's just really getting off the ground mm -hmm. and whether uh, it all sounds very rosy, Paulino, but I've been at UCLA. I don't believe it. There's got to be something, something, some enemies of this program somewhere. Um, I would say yes. Just, just. I mean, having worked in different departments at UCLA and having worked with uh, with different majors and students of different majors, there, there's always a problem with administration in terms of policy issues and and actually just helping alleviate the work of just getting the work done. Um, um, students just getting the majors that they want and that they need that they want to pursue, uh, and there's just all the the policy, the bureaucracy that gets in the way, and all the red tape of, of an LGB studies minor just can be set up um, until you have until you've gone through a certain process. Um, at at, the, at this moment, um, we're expecting that the minor will be um, will, will begin at fall quarter of this year. Um, but we're also kind of expecting some drawbacks from any any particular member of the administration. You know, I'm not aware of of anyone um, who will explicitly be against um, instituting this kind of a program on campus. I'm not aware of, and I'm sure. Um, again, with the whole with the with the thought in mind that the chancellor is in support of this, we can only assume that he's got the, he's got the final word. Um, Antagonism, um, I you know, I, and we sh I've shared with you some some stories about um, faculty members who blatantly ch um, and, and made it explicit that they were not going to discuss LGB issues in their classes. Uh, students who have come to me and said that they don't know what to do in terms of how to pursue their interest in exploring LGB studies and experiences of LGB people uh, because professors would not allow it. I mean, in that respect, I see administration being uh, antagonistic to, to the process of creating a program. Um, the idea you, you, you mentioned earlier um, I guess the validity of having that kind of a program is it separatist? Is it really uh, does it, is it really inclusive of, of students who aren't you know LGB identified? Uh, and how can this kind of a minor be um, be helpful to students who aren't LGB identified? Um, and, and the answer to that I think is is the way that the, the program is being set up is it's it attempts to be very inclusive, uh, very interdisciplinary, and very multidisciplinary to ensure that students who who consider uh, taking a specialization minor in LGB studies um, won't be taking just classes on LGB people, but classes that are connected to or cross-listed with the history, with English, with the arts, with uh, the physical sciences and the life sciences. Um, as well, there are students who take courses like uh, there's a Biology 40 class uh, that's, that's taught yearly. Um, and it, it maximizes capacity of over 500 students who attend this class. Um, and it's a class on, on AIDS. Um, and it's inclusive of exploring the way AIDS has affected the, the lesbian, gay, bisexual community, as well as the heterosexual community, and how, uh, how, how, how the disease has developed and progressed, and, and what it means to individual students. Um, well, that sort of brings to mind the notion of the, I guess, the, the underlying power of education. I mean, I know in the assembly now, the greatest battles we're having really are about education. And not just about whether it should be fully funded or whatever, but I'm talking specific programs. What shall students learn? What shall we require them to know in order to be considered educated people? I remember when I graduated from Harvard Law School, we were welcomed to the ranks of educated men and women. That's, that's what they say when they grant you your degree. Welcome to the ranks of educated men and women. So they must have something in mind when they say we're educated, right? That's what a curriculum is about. Each of you in your own way is spending your lives now including information about ourselves, for ourselves, as an aspect of education. I use it with a big E. Why is this such a powerful arena in which you want to play? The kind of two different two different kinds of education is a goal-oriented education where you're basically being professionally trained. There's a specific purpose why you need to know this because it's going to allow you to do this later on. You know that, and then there's the more general kind of education, which is making you into a kind of better person, someone who contributes in it, 
or fits in better in society, the sort of thing that includes an appreciation of diversity in society, which you try and hopefully, you know, help younger people to understand that diversity is a good thing in, in the world. And I think, in a way, it's that second kind which is very contentious, because it's basically there's a moral issue there, which is very d difficult for some people. I mean, okay, diversity in the abstract is great, but, you know, some specific example of diversity, like gays and lesbians, there's a lot of people who hate gays and lesbians and think that it's very wrong to present them, uh, you know, homosexuality as an acceptable lifestyle or anything like that. So that's why, you know, it's so contentious, that aspect of education that addresses these very basic ways of being a human being in the world. Uh. Well, I, I certainly am interested in that, the second part of the educational yeah. process. That would be my, my focus. Yeah. Because I see education as teaching our children to live in an increasingly diverse society. Yeah. I <laughs> guess maybe the goal would be to transcend all differences ultimately so that we could all live together and it wouldn't make any difference if we were black or white or gay or non-gay or whatever. But I think that society being what it is, that um, if our children do not learn how to live in a diverse society, they are going to have some trouble because the society is changing and is so different all the time. But if they make us invisible, in essence, if we're not allowed to be who we are, it's not a big problem for society, is it? I mean, what? in a sense, our children wouldn't have to learn to live with gay and lesbian people because there wouldn't be any because you wouldn't see them and you don't need to know about them and haven't we done just fine for a thousand years of education without knowing about these people. There are some people who feel people. that way. Yeah. I think, of course, that we should be yelling and screaming and saying, we're here and you need to know about us because we are a part of society and we have made tremendous contributions and the world needs to know about those contributions and they need to know about the contributions mm -hmm. that we can make if we're not crippled mm -hmm. by hatred and prejudice and education is the way that you break through those things. But Sheila's right in the sense that it's when you try and break these things down that then you have these growing pains because then you make people face these issues and previously they did often didn't have to. So that's why well, of course, they, you know, the whole so it, don't ask, don't it, tell. Yes, it's precisely. based on that premise. So just don't tell us. <laughs> you know, you can be who you are, but just don't let anybody know about it. Exactly. I think I think I, I would more look at the process of education as something uh, I mean, as something as a vital part of an individual's uh, identity processing. Um, I mean, I would choose to explore that aspect of education and how it affects an individual. Um, I know, I mean, I, I walk out of school now and, and you know, I'm, I'm bold at stating that I'm a sociology and Asian American studies major. And I have family members who, you know, who will laugh and, and kind of chuckle and, well, what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of what you're going to do with yourself? And I think the process, I think um, that my whole process of looking at education um, as an aid in, in my identity formation uh, in, in exploring the types of things that was relevant to me, the types of, of subject matter and, and the, uh, the aspects of, of my identity that, that uh, I needed to explore, um, is, is, is why I chose the majors that I've chosen. Um, and I think for a lot of students, th it's kind of where it boils down to in terms of looking at education. Um, I've done some tutoring um, uh, on, on several um, um, on several schools, as well as I do academic counseling with students, and we try to we try to um, have this holistic approach of, of examining a student in terms of where the student is in, in, in their formulating their identity and who they are and and what being who they are is going to mean to them. And I think to provide a curriculum uh, to institutionalize a lesbian, gay, bisexual studies allows uh, or permits them. You use the word permitting. To, 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 give them, to give them permission to explore those things without having to search them out and without having to really question it. But it's just, it's, it's, it's there. They can take the opportunity to explore it, or they cannot. But at least it's there for those individuals that I think it's going to make a difference But for. I think it's even more powerful than that. I think that there is a, 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 uh, an unconscious collaboration or a conscious collaboration mm -hmm. to normalize a very small percentage of the population and the rest are considered uh, outside the norm. And therefore, not of interest, not of academic interest, uh, not uh, any way seen as participating in the future in leadership, in developing ideas. If ideas are potent in society, and they are, because ideas create our ideas of what the truth is, 
we think things are true because of ideas that we've heard developed. If we can't do research on that, if we can't present it as authentic and academic conclusion, then we're always marginalized. We're always on the fringe. It's people of color, women, everyone's issues are treated as fringe issues. And I think that is the power of it. And I would say that the work that you're doing, though you may not get up every morning and mm -hmm. think of yourselves as you know, heroes of the movement, mm -hmm. the work that you're doing is really very upstream. Haven't you found that it's been very upstream? There's a kind of ferment going on in academe generally. You know? I think it started, perhaps you know, feminism has as much to it as anything in terms of really changing people's attitudes and saying, yeah, you know, we've got to look at scholarship from a multicultural point of view and that there'll never be a final definitive word on anything really in this but, but there will always be many different attitudes which one has to take into consideration different groups with their own motivations their own histories and so on and and then uh, unless you allow voice to those different groups you really haven't given a complete expression to to people's identity and um, it's uncomfortable in a way for people to deal with that because then you know you're saying there really is no absolute body of knowledge that's the required. It's really something that will be continuously evolving and changing to, uh, depending on different groups that come into society and make themselves known. Uh, it's a kind of continuous turmoil. But that's good for, for, ed for education, I think. Uh -huh. I think. I think that's a really uh, vital point to make because LGB studies, the way it's being uh, presented now, isn't to present it as complete. I mean, it's certainly when we talk about students who write papers and, and who explore a specific area of study uh, that, that, that is relevant to LGB uh, um, people, um, students are thinking, it's never been written before, but here I am writing it now, and maybe someone else can take from it what they can and move on and learn something else. I know with the Asian American Studies program, um, it, it wasn't until a group of, of, of me and my friends came together and we said, you know what, there's never been a study on the, um, on LGB, on the Asian Pacific Islander experience, um, or Asian Pacific Islander lesbian gay bisexual experience. We need to start this up now. And we sat together and we said, let's create an independent studies. Let's go to the library. Let's talk to people. Uh, let's put together our own course. Um, and present it uh, to the department and tell them, you know, look, this is very important to at least 10 students in your program. Um, and the program is small enough as it is, but this is 10 students who say this is very important and we think a lot of students will feel this is very important. It's never been done before, but we're offering you the opportunity to, sh to, to, uh, to explore the issue and to, uh, and to provide it to other students. Take it. Uh, they took it, and the class has been taught for the past two years, and we've gotten a commitment from the head of the department uh, to continue uh, exploring the issue. First, uh, first uh, year it was taught, it was just an introduction to the API LGB experience, and the, the next year it was talking about the, the API LGB gay space, um, their conceptions of space, and it's a totally different topic from when it originally started, and I'm excited to see where it goes next year, uh, but it, it really is, I think, a growing, uh, a growing process, it's, it's never going to just end, and I think LGB studies program, as it's being set forth by the, uh, by the committee, is, is a baby. Uh, but there's so much potential for growth. And I think if a lot of students uh, see it and, and see that it's respected, uh, maybe it won't be respected immediately, but it needs to get to that point somewhere and there needs to be a starting point, um, uh, students can really take off with it you know, in ways that I wish I could have. Um, I think I could go back to all my papers that I've written and maybe put them together and compile a book. Um, maybe this is a place to, to, to hand that over and say, use, my, use what I've done so that no one just repeats it, but they take on from it and they explore new things and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger. I mean, this is how the other, uh, the ethnic studies, you know, right. programs have started. You know, it's not to and the And you know, it's interesting what, what, what Simon said too, it reminded me of the ways in which we discover knowledge. I mean, even the notion of the kind of scientific method has really been attacked by, I, I think, by feminism to begin with, because you know there's a lot of storytelling that goes on in every community except the sort of most uh, ancient, rigorous, ri rigid kind of academic community still left. The no in Asian Pacific studies, in African American studies, in women's studies, we tell stories because you can't do a lot of research and find your history. You need to listen to the stories of people who've been through it. I mean, the history of lesbian culture in Los Angeles is not in a book. 
yet it was rich through the 20s and 30s and 40s um, and there needs to be such a thing the stories are there but we don't we can't do the research I mean mm -hmm. I, it, the oral history notion is also an important one and I don't know your students may be having to discover their identities on their own is there anything that in in the curriculum itself or in what the sort of teachers can do that help gay lesbian bisexual students sort of at that critical age in junior high and high school I mean what is their identity uh, <clears throat> there isn't much in the curriculum I have to be honest with you I think what our teachers can do is by the affirmation that they give by simply acknowledging the subject when it is brought up and the way they present it I mean that might light the spark for some young man or woman to come forth and pursue it more on his or her own. I mean, I think it's inspirational to hear with, obviously you're of a different generation. This is the younger generation. I mean, I wonder when I hear you talk, you know, what was the spark that yeah. got him going? Somewhere along the line in this great educational process where not much is being said about this. So I think that our teachers can provide that spark. The curriculum, that's going to take I mean, there are efforts being made along those lines, but rather than a single curriculum, there are kind of piecemeal efforts being made on all levels of education. You know, how do you in elementary school, uh, you know, how can you incorporate this subject, which is so controversial and everything, you know, in talking about diversity in families, you know, how can you address the subject of name calling? The way a teacher presents that and responds to the class can be very affirming or it can be very defeating. I'd like to ask a question, Gina, if I may. Um, one of the things that always struck me th is that with children, um, often they don't know whether they're going to be gay or lesbian or whatever, but you have this sort of gender variance. You know, have boys who are relatively feminine, girls who are relatively masculine, you know, even before puberty and so on. And, and the, sometimes these people become gay and lesbian later, sometimes they don't maybe. But it seems like that, that is a very public aspect of their identity when they're children, which other children react to very strongly and they get stigmatized or whatever. And uh, is that something you deal with also in, in, in your program? And how, how does that sort of show itself in, um, in, in, in the way that these kids it, um, well, I wish I could say that we had a program <laughs> that dealt specifically with <laughs> those issues, but I think that uh, as part of our educational efforts and our workshops and everything, I think we do try and attack that issue, which is an issue of sexism, really. Right. And how right. do we, you know, how do we sensitize teachers to uh, deal with students who are different? and not place a stigma on uh, boys who may have an artistic flair or girls who are very athletic. And I think we are helped in that by there are a lot of efforts being made through the Sex Equity Commission in the district. And so we do deal with it that way. But again, it's, it's a sensitizing process. Mm -hmm. And I think that if your teachers, your teachers have to be comfortable about who they are and they have to be right. comfortable about these issues themselves. If they're comfortable about the issues themselves, then I think they can provide a safe atmosphere for the students. Well, I think, I'm sorry. Go ahead, well, sorry. It's, it's, it seems like the kids who are gay or lesbian, but are not especially, you know, gender nonconformist, if you like, um, go through their school life fairly easily, if you like. I mean, they they don't they're not necessarily they're not out. out. They tend That's to be right. good academic performers mm -hmm. often, and they're not picked out. And maybe they don't come out until they're in college or later or something. And whereas the, these kids who are gender variant are really. Well, they are the exposed, most highly right? stigmatized of all, and they have the most yeah. difficult time. Right. And it's it's very difficult uh, for teachers uh, in dealing with those students. But I think that uh, the important thing is, one of the most important things is that teachers from elementary school level on have to somehow communicate the idea that it is okay to be different. It's okay to be gay. It doesn't, make, it doesn't mean everyone is gay or lesbian, but it's okay to be that way if that's what you are. Now, they're not going to be able to say it in first grade with those words, and they're going to have to develop their own format for bringing differences into the class and for making kids respectful of differences, but I, I think that's essential. Well, you know, education has an even, uh, I think, an additional tool or responsibility in that what we're talking about has an underlying social or cultural purpose in life. That is, education is also a way to explore 
the reasons why our culture does what it does and the reasons why it wants to draw such incredibly rigid lines between female and male. If you ask the question, why is this such an important distinction? So important that it's the first and only question we ask when a baby's born. Essentially, we could ask a million things about a new human life. What's the only thing we ask? Did you have a boy or a girl? And we don't even ask that question. Sometimes we just say, what'd you have? And everyone knows that the only question that's being asked here is a question of gender. So we ask then somewhere, hopefully, in our educational process, why is this such an incredible distinction that we are thrown into the breach of it so as to keep these rigid distinctions? If you vary a little bit toward the feminine, toward the masculine, uh, and you're on the wrong side of that line, you know, and we're the worst offenders, allegedly because we're the example of, of gender benders. Education can also ask, why is this our culture? Uh, and and uh, you know, what is it about this that's so dangerous? The other thing I was gonna ask you though that we also can ask is, is there really something in gay and lesbian history and culture to be taught that's really different? Because this is the other question you get about sort of the, the separate studies questions, and I'm sure you too. Oh, I, I think totally. I mean, I, 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 you know, there's some people who say that, you know, gays and lesbians are just like everyone else, just they ha happen to be attracted to people of the same sex. You know, why make a big deal of it? I, I really come from very the opposite side. I think the gays and lesbians are really different, you know. I mean, they're tremendously diverse, but really they do have their own culture and history that is very different in many ways from that of straight people, historically. But is it a culture and history of an oppressed people that had to develop something different in um, the shadows? Or, I, I know there's I, not a yes-no answer um, to this, but I, I love thinking about it. I think it. oppression is part of it. And I, I think that any you know, out group ha has that, the quality of uh, that belongs to an oppressed group, like traditional Jewish culture is definitely the same thing, and uh, many other groups. But I think also there's something intrinsic to being gay or lesbian. Something biologically there, something in the brain, hypothalamus, whatever, which tends to make gays and lesbians a little different. It's something, I think, connected somehow with gender and, 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 and not belonging to a strict gender class, but being in this sort of third gender area. You know, if you look at Walter Williams' work with the Badash and the Amazons, you know, in, in Native American cultures, you see that, 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 that there's something about the way gays and lesbians look at the world, their interests, their, their, their spirituality and all that, that is really different and has something special to contribute. Well, we've been shamans and witches and artists, um, and I think not by virtue of being um, exorcised from the group because shamans and witches were really not in their own cultures uh, uh, separate. Um, so I guess that this freedom to sort of be who you are along a, quite a continuum of sexuality must have been important. Oh, absolutely. And then, I mean, you know, lesbians so often have been, you know, leaders basically. And, and uh, that's something, you know, they basically led the feminist movement and, and uh, or were very, very, uh, you know, active in it. And uh, in that sense, they really contributed something to the entire population of women. Well, in the uh, social welfare movement, and right, I mean, exactly. we weren't yeah, certainly yeah, yeah. able to be out so, in those days. But when you start looking at mm -hmm. those women who uh, started the, uh, the the whole notion of taking care of the poor, um, right. you know, that that kind of devotion. But I was going to ask you too, uh, Paulino, as a, a sort of as a as a double minority, mm -hmm. with experience in uh, Asian Pacific Islander. Uh, culture and also uh, uh, targeted discrimination and as a as a gay man uh, it, do you see a similarity in those uh, the way those communities are treated kind of in in the context of the university or or education um, I mean it, it's it's a very uh, difficult question um, to answer I know where I my positionality, I guess, is, is never to have ever separated the two, and that they've always been one and the same. Uh, I know even in the context of, of, of Asian American discourse and in the movement of an oppressed group, um, I am very much aware of, of my own oppression within that oppressed group, um, very much. Um, very much so in the different organizations that I'm involved with. Um, but we, uh, you know, we've done I think I can say that I've done my work with, with friends who are also uh, gay Filipinos, uh, stay in the Filipino community, um, where 
we're at a point where uh, the uh, hiring committee um, for a project like SPEAR, the campus retention program, um, is hiring an openly gay man to direct the whole program. And I think that's, that's very much uh, exhibiting the evolution that at least that community has, has taken at UCLA. Um, it, it's, it's a very hard question to answer. I don't I, know. I, it's I hard for me to say whether one, 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 one minority status is more oppressive than the other minority status. It's certainly given uh, a particular situation where being um, Asian is more salient than, than, than being gay. You know, mm -hmm. one, one minority status is, is going to stand out more and becomes more my issue and more the kind of thing that, that I scream about, you know, that, that I'm angry about. Um, and, and vice versa when it's the other way around. Well, I know that all communities have been trivialized in their time. Mm -hmm. There was nothing to teach about black studies it was said when they were first proposing it at, on the campuses. And now I don't think anyone would say such a thing because we're so much more aware of all the ways in which uh, and all the subject matters that you know, can be found. And I, now when I hear that about, well, what is there about lesbians and gays? Aren't they just everywhere and they just happen to be gay, like you said, Simon? Uh, we, we will have uh, something to say about it. Um, you're not going to believe this, but our time is up. Um, it sort of went That's fast, and I want to thank you very, very much for being here today and for um, talking about this uh, subject matter uh, in terms of our own education for our community. hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. I hope you'll stick with us for all of our shows, uh, and I hope whenever anyone says to you, uh, why should we have lesbian gay education, you'll just say, it's here, get used to it. <laughs>